those words. And, and, and also um, your pronunciation of the Spanish words is perfect. Um, incredible. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And let me go ahead and, and share my screen and, and then we can, we can get started. Um, so I will, I will try to, to, to share a, a few uh, ideas that I have been working on recently. And, and these ideas have to do with some kind of frustration. And you will see where my, my frustration has been growing up after more than 25 years of uh, conducting experiments in the field and, and even in the lab and trying to talk to other behavioral scientists. And, um, and, and this frustration is growing up. So I think this is, this is a time to reflect um, in retrospect of what we have been doing and looking forward to what should be going uh, on ahead for uh, experimental and behavioral economics regarding the ecological challenges that we are dealing these days. Um, so that's that's the idea and that's the the, the title of the of the talk. Um, so let me let me say a little bit of what the behavioral revolution has been like. Uh, this is one of the most interesting paradigmatic changes in, in social sciences, if you think about, and definitely for economics. But that, that uh, behavioral revolution uh, has to do with questioning the assumptions, the assumptions, let's say, about human behavior, about human preferences. This is, this is not trivial. What, what the behavioral revolution did, thanks to experiments, by the way, is to question the assumptions that for decades uh, were made about humans. I'm not saying from the beginning because Adam Smith figured this out way before any behavioral scientist. Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments uh, became the, the first landmark piece of behavioral economics, if you want to call it that way. Uh, but, but then something happened and we began to, to forget about the, the psychological and sociological and philosophical aspects of behavior. And then we, we ended up in a very narrow, um, definition of what human behavior was in economics and definitely the behavioral revolution questions those those assumptions about what we can do what we care for how we process information and again this is not a trivial uh, major change uh, for economics but also this revolution meant changing the methods and um, i mean for starters talking of economics as a, as a as an experimental science was revolutionary too i mean for many years the idea was that economics was more like an observation and science. You needed to wait for the phenomena, collect the data, and try to decipher what happened there, um, like astronomers. And then all of a sudden, uh, economists began to realize that you could create a controlled experiment and, and then uh, control for variables, manipulate other variables, and try to understand uh, causal relationships regarding human behavior. And that has been also very revolutionary in paradigmatic uh, terms. This led to changing theories. And um, now we have important and um, crucial theories about human behavior. I mean, when we talk about prospect theory, this is not trivial. Prospect theory questions very many foundations of the conventional neoclassical model. And now prospect theory can be taught in the classroom, can be explained and can be supported on data and can revolutionize how we understand, for example, financial markets. But hey, Remember, prospect theory had way back in the history, in the early 70s, the participation of environmental economists. This was Jack Kanech. Jack Kanech worked with Amos Tversky and Dan Kahneman, and they figured out the idea of the endowment effect. And the endowment effect was based on the difference, the systematic differences between willingness to pay and willingness to accept for environmental amenities. I mean, environmental economics was right at the beginning uh, contributing to this revolution and, and, and we should not forget that. So even from the beginning of the behavioral revolution, we had the participation of environmental issues right there. And of course, this led to changing policy implications, right? So all this is encouraging, is, is, is a, a, it makes you enthusiastic about thinking how behavior and experimental economics can be used to change and understand the world. But at the same time, there are things that still need to be done. And this is when I bring this idea of my frustration, which is this disconnect with, between 
individual action and the aggregate outcomes. And let me try to develop that a little bit more. This puzzling disconnect that I have been thinking is the result of, again, as I said, working for more than two decades doing experiments and finding over and over and over many important patterns of human behavior, right? So we understand that protecting nature and the provision of ecosystem services from, from natural capital require cooperation and collective action. And we have been studying that. And we keep finding that humans can be honest, they can be kind, they can be fair, they can be cooperative, they can be trusting and trustworthy. And all these are important for cooperation and collective action. And we find that humans are often investing costly resources to help others, to reduce inequality, to cooperate, to follow and maintain social norms. And this is very systematic. This is not, we're not talking about anomalies. This is very regular patterns that humans have all these capacities that are required for collective action to happen. And collective action, we know it's key for the preservation of nature and nature services. And this is supported not only uh, from economics, but from many disciplines, all the way from neuroscience, paleontologists, ethnographers, very important theory in biology, in mathematical biology, archaeology. All those keep giving us the, 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 the support, the evidence that humans can be all these important things for protecting nature, right? And yet, at the macro level, what are we finding? we keep seeing deforestation going in, uh, in the aggregate at very high rates. Deforestation in Latin America is high as it has, uh, has ever done. Look at what happens in Brazil, what happens in my home country, Colombia. And um, carbon and air pollution, carbon emissions and air pollution emissions are continuing to return even to post-pandemic, to, 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 to the levels that it were before the pandemic. And then Fossil fuel markets continue to grow and grow as if nothing had happened. I mean, the European Union declared a fossil fuel gas, natural gas, as a green uh, energy source, right? Because of the geopolitical reasons. And of course, we need to understand that. But what I'm trying to say is that at the individual level, we find these things about humans. And at the same time, at the macro level, we are not seeing the major changes that we need. And this is my frustration from a behavioral perspective. What is it that is not connecting yet? And, and also poverty and inequality that remain unchanged in many places. Uh, notice, we keep finding that people are inequality averse, that people are fair, that people are prosocial, they can be altruistic, they can be solidary. And at the same time, we keep seeing uh, just a uh, concerning levels of poverty and inequality that are not changed. So with, with that in mind, I, I think that this disconnect is what's motivating for me. So I'm trying to think about what, it, what are we missing? What are we missing? And there are two recent papers that I think every single behavioral and experimental scientist should be reading right now. So let me go over these two uh, quickly because I think they are, they are key in, in, in this regard. The, the first one is a paper that has to do with a large meta-analysis on the very small or even null effects from most nudges that have been used, have been being used in, in, in field, in, in practice, in reality, and in many places around the world. So, so this is a paper by Stefano de la Viña and, and Linus. And this was published this year in Econometrica. And these people collected 126 randomized trials. I mean, these are randomized trials already, right? So we are cleaning up for problems of endogeneity, selection bias, and the like. Uh, these are randomized trials. They introduced 241 nudges. And all together, we're talking about more than 23 million people participating in these in this different uh, nudges experiments for that. And uh, two messages from these two graphs from this particular paper that I highly recommend that you read. These are the different effects in terms of the treatment compared to the, to the counterfactual, right, to the baseline, and in terms of the effects. And on average, what you see in both graphs is that these effects are rather small. Okay, so the mean, the mean average could be somewhere between zero and 10%. And in the left-hand side, 
and it could be very close to 0% to 1% or 2% in the right-hand side graph. The left-hand side graph is the not just the studies that were published in academic journals. The right-hand side are the nudges that were conducted by nudge units, like the famous UK nudge unit, but now we find nudge units all over the world in many countries. And these are not necessarily published in academic journals. And there are two or three takeout messages from this, from this particular paper. One of them, the left-hand side higher effects can be attributed probably to publication bias. We know that's a problem in academia. Maybe those were more carefully done. But then the right-hand side, which are not necessarily published in academic journals, they are telling us that these effects are even smaller when they are scaled up to the field. And that's one of the things that I'm going to, to, to highlight here. In these nudges, there are some of them, some of these have to do with environmental issues, right? Not just to save energy, not just to save water and the like. And again, the effects are very small or even no. So that's that's one of the messages. Namely, if we are going to use behavioral knowledge, behavioral sciences and experiments, anyway, it looks like after all these years of using these tools to induce change in human behavior, the changes in those behavior, even if they are statistically significant, economically, they are not in terms of the greater impact. So. That's one point. Very small messages, very small effects from these particular nudges, some of which have to do with inducing environmental changes in, in people's behavior. So that's, that's one piece of the information. The, the second question or the second point out of this particular study, and I'm going to lead into the next paper that I think is very relevant here, is that nudges may be distracting us from greater solutions. What I'm trying to say is, and, and I'm going to follow in more detail this, at what if these environmental nudges, let's say uh, nudges for um, eating more organic or for eating less meat or for saving more water, are distracting us from thinking about what do we need to do at the structural level in terms of major changes in policies, regulation, legislation, technologies. And that's the, the opening of, of my next step. So this is the next paper. And this is Chatter and Lowenstein. Uh, they create, they, they distributed this paper recently this year, and it's going to be published in Behavioral and Brain Science. It's in press now. Um, and this is the paper that created a lot of discussion among behavioral and experimentalists in the, in the recent months. And this paper is about what they call the I-frame and the S-frame. And, and the subtitle, How Focusing on Individual Level Solutions Has Led Behavior Public Policy Astray, which in fact, they cite the, the De La Nina and Linus paper too. And let me go in detail into this paper because I think it's important. So I'm going to use the, the exact words what, that, that they use. And what they call the I-frame is the idea of the very individual level neural and cognitive machinery that underpins their thoughts and behaviors, the thoughts and behaviors of humans, okay? So this is the I-frame, the very individual level decision-making machinery. And then the S-frame being the system of rules, norms, and institutions by which we live, okay? So this goes all the way from constitutions to legislation to social norms to conventions among people. Think about it. When we do experimental economics in the field or in the lab, yes, we are talking about I-frame variables. Usually those are our outcome variables that we want to observe. And then we do consider S-frame type of conditions in our experiments. I'm not saying that in the experiments, we don't talk about the S-frame. Of course we do. We introduce different rules, different social norms, different institutions, and see how people behave. But notice, we don't address the changing of the systems of rules, norms, and institutions. We just see them as determinant variables of human behavior. So it is more like the S-frame determining the I-frame. But I'm asking exactly the opposite. How is it that we're going to change the S-frame 
thanks or based on the behavioral knowledge that we have today about humans. And that's the problem. So what they say is that the iframe types of policies is about changing behavior without changing the rules of the game. Why? Among others, they highlight, because it is cheap, it's quick, and it's politically less contagious. Think about it. Putting a notch, you don't need to pass a reform in Congress. Putting out a notch doesn't require you to uh, validate certain legal restrictions because it's basically within the status quo. Let's try to do this little notch. That's why it's called a notch. This little notch to get people to change something without changing the rules of the game. And that is critical here. So these S-frame changes have created this, this, this transformation, but not in terms of the I uh, frame changes. And think about how these I frame changes that I just mentioned before from the other paper have very small or no results for the most part. So these interventions via I frame may be delaying or even eroding the possibilities of the S frame changes. And this is, this is the point that they are trying to make, right? And, and they say, and I'm quoting, history seems to show that the solution to individual human frailty has been to change the system, not guide the individual. The gold standard of experimental testing provides a further push towards I frame interventions where different individuals may be randomly assigned distinctive interventions and away from S frame interventions. So, Wrapping up these this, 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 this main points, we are not changing the system, the structure of the system, and yet we are creating this illusion that by pushing people to do the right thing without changing the structure, we are going to create solutions. And to me, the particular concern is what is, what is happening regarding the major environmental challenges that we face today. And some of the examples that Charles and Lewis did mention, in fact, are regarding the environment. They talk about climate change and carbon emissions. And so, for example, think about the difference between not just that give people social feedback, what others do or what people are doing, and, and how can that reduce the possibility of having carbon pricing or changing building codes, right? And in fact, they cite a, a particular study that Lewis did in which they tested if introducing a notch on saving energy had an effect in people's support for a carbon tax. And what they find is the problem of crowding out, meaning that when people felt better with themselves because they did some change about saving a little bit of energy, like turning off the lights, it reduced the likelihood that they were going to support a carbon tax. So think about that. It's the problem of the, of the moral wiggle room that we talk in experiments. It's, it's the problem of the moral licensing that we have been studying, right? So we feel good about it, and then we don't, we don't change the system. And yet we know that carbon pricing is key these days. A carbon tax would probably shift technology and human behavior much more effectively than introducing these little changes. Same thing they mentioned, examples of plastic waste, issues of nutrition and obesity, healthcare, and all of these cases and retirement, these are all cases in which we can think about the notches that don't change the system versus major changes that we need to do, let's say in the tax structure, in the legislation, in the regulations that guide how businesses operate. And this is the, the, the concern that I am having with this. Again, environmental examples, I was mentioning already this, and it looks like nothing changed after the pandemic in terms of the energy mix. And it looks like the pandemic almost taught us nothing. Uh, very sad to say, but we are looking at levels of consumption of fossil fuels that are just similar pre and post pandemic. And all this uh, emphasis on green nudges that I mentioned and the reduction of the carbon tax. Um, and if you're looking about a thesis, if there are students here looking for thesis, think about all the ESG strategies among companies in the private sector is really fascinating. Most companies these days are getting serious about ESG strategies, environmental and social uh, corporate governance strategies, right? So it would be interesting to see the following. Notice 
how many times what these companies are doing is that they are returning the responsibility back to the consumers, right? If you remember recently, a major oil company was brought to trial to the Hague, the, the Hague International Court for the responsibility on carbon emissions and climate change. And, that it, and, and they finally were found to be guilty by the court and they are in the process of paying those fines. But the argument in the defense of this oil company, if you look it around, the argument was that at the end, it was the consumers of oil who were to blame for messing up the environment. So think about that. To what extent much of the ESG strategies in companies are becoming returning back to the consumers the responsibility. And I'm not saying consumers don't have a responsibility. We do. I mean, we turn on and off the lights. We eat or not eat meat. We do all kinds of things. But washing your hands and cleaning your, your responsibility by saying that it's only the consumers, I think it's an interesting uh, thing to look at. Um, and yes, G strategies in companies sometimes look like that. Um, so the, the, the and, and there's one more uh, possible thesis that, that I keep finding, uh, keep, keep thinking about. And it is with now with the, with the development of the, S, the, the 17 SDGs, how many of these SDGs have become the target of nudges? Many of the SDGs have to do with environmental issues, but how many have become target of nudges? And how much then reaching the goals, the sustainable development goals has been creating much more emphasis on this type of nudges? and less on the structural changes that we need, okay? So let me stop here and say I plead guilty to because I've been part of this trend. I mean, I just finished a major experiment with a big bank in Colombia in trying to reduce credit delinquency during COVID by using prosocial preferences and trying to create a, a strategy to reduce bank delinquency in credit cards, mortgages, and personal consumer credit or, or loans, and I have been doing that. And if you, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, we found the small effects. They are statistically significant. We have a paper out. We hope it will be published. Maybe we can create some discussion and controversy. Uh, but notice we are all involved in this, and yet for the environmental part, I keep worrying if this is going to be enough. So I think that and, and for, for, the, for the, 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 the rest 10 minutes that I'm going to spend on this, my idea is to try to propose the following, which is if we are paying too much attention on the I frame in the bottom, not enough attention in the S frame in the top, um, how are we going to understand the changes in the S frame? And for that, uh, thinking about problems like crowding out that I already mentioned uh, about the the, the people supporting with less likelihood a carbon tax when they are introduced with a notch strategy. And um, I wrote many, many, many years ago a paper regarding crowding out that when you introduce a penalty on people's over extraction of a resource, it reduces the possibility of cooperation among the group members. And so this disconnect between the I frame and the S frame is something that is, is, is troubling, uh, troubling for me and something that I have been working. So what I'm going to propose is the following, and it's just a start to lay out here some conversation. And I'm going to talk about the C frame, like a bridge between the I frame and the S frame. And by the way, sorry that it should say there, the S frame, not the F frame. And the C frame, what I'm going to say is when we talk about communities, cooperation, collective action, civil society, everything with a C, okay? And, and notice, the C frame is where we build many institutions, social norms that change behavior, and from the bottom up changes in the structures. Notice how the co these communities, cooperation, collective action, are about how we constrain and align individuals towards group-oriented goals. At the end, is a small group that is pushing the members of the group to do something that is beneficial to the group, even if it is a person at a personal uh, cost and how then they aggregate processes from group to group to group to elevate the political cloud and eventually create a change in the S frame. So the C frame as a bridge between the I frame and the S frame is something that I, I, I am proposing here as a next step forward in, into this discussion. Because it is at the C frame 
where formal institutions meet individual actions. And I'm going to give you three examples, and I'm going to go in detail only one with one because I'm, I'm concerned about the time. But also because of the C frame is where the institutions, the informal institutions, start emerging and, and are sustained or die. So even changes in the S frame can die because of dynamics at the local community level. And that's at the community level where people agree that this is a good thing to do, or when people protest against a uh, change in the legal framework, okay? And in that way, uh, it is also where in a, in a badly or naive way, the S-frame policies are designed and may fail if they don't get the support of the groups. And when I say the groups is among your neighbors, among your et ethnic group, uh, within your identity group that creates the possibility to get together and agree on something better in terms of behavior. So I'm going to talk about, I, I have a few examples, but I, I'm going to talk about only one of them. And the two first, you, you can look it up because it's really fascinating. One is the women's war in Nigeria in the 1930s. You can look it up exactly like that. And it's a fascinating story of women protesting against the British rule and how they ended up changing the British legal framework in controlling Nigeria because of dynamics at the sea frame by women. The other fascinating story is how foot binding ended in China after 1,000 years of prevalence. Foot binding lasted 1,000 years in China. And within one generation, it disappeared. And it looks like it had to do a lot with C-frame type of dynamics. And lastly, the one that I'm going to mention more in more detail is this particular land reform that happened in Colombia in a collective land titling that created major changes with greater impacts. And this is the third case. This is the result of a land reform that proposed to title 6 million hectares to black communities in the Pacific coast of Colombia between the 1980s, the process started all the way to the 2000s. This is the particular region where this was implemented in the Western part of Colombia near the Pacific coast. And this region is where most of the black Afro descendants live in Colombia. And during the 1997 and 98, I happened to have the fortune of doing my dissertation work in those region, in that region, in studying human behavior using these experiments in the field. And with those uh, experiments, try to understand what hinders or what promotes cooperation among these people. And the, if the collective action problem uh, was solved, when I looked at the uh, field experiments that I did, but also in retrospect to the historical process of this title. So I was running this experiment. These are the pictures of the time that I was doing these experiments in the field. And I was doing also interviews and workshops in trying to understand what was happening with the games and in conversation with key actors, leaders, the elderly and the like. And this was done in 1998. And this has a context that is really interesting because this is the region in the right that I showed you. And this is the sequence in terms of time. So the bluer the, the shades, the more re, the, the earliest collective land tiling that happened, all the way to the redder, which were the last uh, pieces of land that were titled by the government to these black communities. But remember, these were collective titles. This was not individual properties. These were pieces of land that were given to entire communities. And this has a history that I don't have to go in detail, but it has to do all the way previous to the major constitutional reform in 1991. But out of that constitution in 1991, the expedition of a law that said that the government had a mandate in 1993 to collectively title land to these communities. And with help of many international agencies and a political decision in the country, they, they started titling this, this land and they succeeded in land entitling almost 6 million hectares of land to these communities. So this is, this is the continuous of line in the, in, the, in the map in the left or the graph in the left or the right. This is the number of hectares that were titled, the cumulative number of hectares that were titled to the different number of community councils. So we had now the fortune in terms of data of having communities where, who were pre-treatment, during treatment and post-treatment, and we had the chance to collect data on these communities, okay? And 
we knew a lot about these communities before they were titled and after they were titled because of a major anti-poverty program in the government that targeted individual households. So we had all the data sets from the government, household by household, and we knew where each household was located so that we could not, we could understand what was the outcome in each of these households before and after the title. And by the way, that was the year which I conducted my experiments to try to understand the micro foundations of those things. I'm not going to go into the detail of the econometrics of the results. These are two papers that are published, but let me highlight some of the most important uh, results. First, because of the titling, per capita income increased, okay? Secondly, poverty, the indices of poverty were reduced. Wealth was increased in terms of the assets that the communities owned. Remember, this is not private property. This is collective property, but yet the wealth of the households increased, school attendance improved, and home improvements increased. Remember, these people don't have a title over their, over their piece of land. It's a collective title. And yet people were investing more on the home and they were reducing overcrowding of the households. So these were all positive findings that we found in this, in this paper. In another paper, we also find more related to our topic here, which is positive effects in terms of deforestation. Against the counterfactual, the collective titling reduced deforestation in these areas. So what happened? This was sea frame in action. These were communities organized during the 1980s who began to organize in little groups and began to push for the government to recognize their, uh, their, their use of land in a collective manner. And then the constitution came and because of the constitution, this law came and it changed the S frame. So these C frame dynamics created a change in the S frame dynamics. And at the end, we ended up with a positive result with this change of policies there. So what is the role of the I frame here? That's where my experiments, I think, come into play, which is how at the individual level in these communities, there were a number of mechanisms that we are now well aware of, thanks to a lot of experiments in the field and in the lab about how trust, reciprocity, reputation affect the behavior of humans within groups, how groups maintain social norms of cooperation among themselves through different mechanisms like costly punishment, pro-social preferences, and the like. So these different examples are just uh, cases that I have been working on recently on trying to collect examples on how these C frame dynamics can explain changes in the outcomes at the S frame. And these are just three examples, but I, I mentioned mostly the, 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 the example about the collective titling in the Afro-Colombian communities. So I think the, the idea is to continue exploring, and this is my agenda, my recent research agenda, to continue exploring different cases in which C frame collective action at the community level begin to build up a movement that eventually changes the system. That's what I've been talking. So for example, the indigenous movement in South America that is changing constitutions to create, for example, rights to nature. Getting nature to have constitutional rights is a major transformation in constitutional law and it's happening in several places in, in South America. Uh, the movement of the cocaleros in Bolivia with Evo Morales is an interesting case. The case of the suffragettes in the, in the voting rights for women, uh, the movements for slavery abolition, Forest Rights Act in India. Uh, and if you have any other ideas that you can send to me, I would appreciate examples in which small scale community level dynamics aggregate and begin pushing from the bottom up to transformations there. So there are things that are going at the micro level. Most of these, I think, are out there in the literature, so I'm not going to go into detail, but they have to do with this basic idea. You can put it in the Thomas Schelling typical model of collective action, which is how do we get out of the trap of the temptation of free riding and how we create a, a dynamic to change the dynamic of the group to shift towards the better G point, which is the collective action outcome. Um, and of course, there are different dynamics. There are problems of interior equilibria and all these can be modeled and we have now much better knowledge of how these work. Um, I'm going to skip this because this is from an old paper that I had, but I'm going to just reinforce that the work of Elinor Rostrom is key in understanding these micro, micro dynamics within the group. Uh, but the idea is that there are different, let's call it layers that can be used into uh, understanding how people transform the subjective payoffs of the game so that they can transform 
a prisoner's dilemma into a coordination game or even into a, 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 a cooperation solution with a strong equilibrium towards cooperation. And this is something that I was working with Elinor Oster many years ago, uh, again, out of my, my dissertation work. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, 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 to skip this because I, I'm running out of time, but this graph I think is key here. Here's my problem. I think that if we want to move to a green equilibrium, let's say in the, in, the, in, the red, in the green dot there, in which we find better equilibrium in terms of behavior, that even small uh, pushes into the system maintain this high equilibrium, let's say of conservation, of reducing deforestation, of maintaining better water use, of maintaining fisheries. We need to jump from the low equilibrium, which is the blue dot down there. And my concern is that these nudges, these small pushes, are not enough to bring the dot all the way to the peak of the mountain and jump into the better equilibrium. It's just going to bring back to the low equilibrium problem. That's my concern when we don't think about the S frame because the S frame might be necessary to push the blue dot all the way to the mountain and jump into the green equilibrium, which is the one that we are looking for. Other people have been talking about this in different ways. There's a recent paper by Sam Bolz and Wendy Carlin on how to think about the government and the markets as a very simplistic way. And if we talk about the government, the markets and civil society, maybe we can understand better the complementarity of the three. And the civil society case is again, the C-frame dynamics in many ways. And so if we look back at the behavioral revolution, I think we have learned things. And notice we found a niche, our comfort zone in doing experiments. And it was mostly working on the iframe. And this is a mea culpa a type of reflection of that. Notice we found ways of finding larger sample sizes is using within subjects designs. We found ways of paying people small amounts and still be salient and with incentives. And we started paying only one random round. So this is all the sophistication that we have been doing in experiments in the lab and the field, low cost stakes, and some external validity to justify our work. All this has been fine and we have been learning a lot from this. We even extended the weird samples to non-weird samples, if you remember the metaphor of Joe Hendrick and others. We have been collaborating with the RCT community and we have studied much more how the S-frame alters the I-frame, but not in the opposite direction, which is my concern, okay? Uh, but what has remained absent? Notice, we keep, not understanding how the S frame changes, just how I frame changes. We need to understand how we change the system, not how the system determines individual behavior. Obviously, the group dynamics are less frequently studied because, among others, it's too expensive. To have one community as one observation is very expensive in the field, right? How a whole community changes. So we try to understand how one individual changes. One more. We don't understand the powerful. The powerful who define the system, those are usually absent. We don't get them into our experiments. It's very hard to get them. It's very expensive to get them. Their opportunity cost of time is huge. So we keep you doing experiments with people that are in the masses, but they are not necessarily the powerful. And we need to get the powerful inside the understanding of the behavioral mechanisms because it is the powerful that sustain the S frame. It is the powerful that keep controlling the S frame. And the representatives of the powerful too are hard to find there. So what do I see ahead? I need to, I, I think we need to get out of our comfort zone. Uh, we have learned a lot from what we have been doing, how consumers, voters, workers respond to incentives, uh, but we have learned less on how firms and managers fire uh, or hire or promote workers, how firms affect public policy, um, how politicians manipulate, guide, influence, bribe, or cheat. We know less about these things. The challenge is how we're going to understand the behavioral foundations of the powerful. I think that's key to understand the S frame. Um, and it is very hard to make changes in the S frame endogenous in the experiments that we're doing. But I don't think we should then ignore this question because I think it's crucial. Uh, where can we find clues? Some people have been doing things. There's an old paper by Ensfer and John List uh, with experiments with 76 CEOs in Costa Rica in the coffee industry. Uh, Bandeira and Imran Rasul have been doing 
uh, experiments in changing incentives for managers, not only for workers. And uh, there's a paper by Kircher and Renson on the annual review of political science on trying to see how we can understand political elites. Um, Eliana La Ferrara has been doing many interesting things regarding communities, king groups, neighborhoods that I think are related to, to the to the CIPRE. Uh, so the more general question is how we are going to understand how communities as bridges between the I-frame and the S-frame are going to shape or impede or replicate or increase the possibilities that we change the S-frame for the better good, and in particular to the ecological and environmental challenges that. Um, and if it is not going to be not just, then what? What is it that we're going to do? Um, I think that the I-frame must remain. We need to continue understanding preferences, rationality, agency, but the S-frame needs to be studied too in this context and how it is driven by behavioral factors because of power, because of bargaining, because of social preferences, and how the I-frame is going to understand uh, the changes in the S-frame. And for that, I think the, the C-frame could be an answer. So if I were to answer to Chatter and Lowenstein, I would say, let's bring in this C-frame idea and see how in between, because of collective action and social norms and guidelines, networks and social ties, we're going to understand how individual behavior changes the system. And, and, and I think that's, that's the challenge right now. At the end, ultimately, the question is how we're going to met to get political economy into the behavioral sciences to understand how changes in the structures are going to achieve. And with that, let me stop there and give you my thank you for uh, being here and listening to these uh, ideas. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. It was fascinating for me. I, I, I mean, I was always Nara, thinking about- Nara, I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me? Hear me now? No? Uh, Can you hear me? I don't hear anything. Whoops. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Can you no. hear me now? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. It was wonderful. And I was always thinking about this individual action versus systemic change. How, what would mediate between it, between these two and so on. So it was uh, very inspiring again. Uh, so let's hear what the audience, what kind of comments or questions do they have? And then I may add something on top of it perhaps later. So any questions and comments, please. The floor is open for the audience. If getting the first one is always hard. I can maybe. perhaps start if, ah, Gertam, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah. yeah, maybe I can break the ice. Uh, and yes. the, thanks for the fascinating talk. Uh, I was going to ask which communities would be an ideal start of this change? Because my intuition would be from the elites, from the artists, intellectuals, etc. cetera. Uh, but we just wait for them to move for decades now. Uh, all the examples you gave were the, the bottom-up processes, but I guess. Hey, no, no, I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the very definition of community is, is tricky, right? What, what do we call a community? What do we call, what are the boundaries? Where, where I mean, first of all, we, probably every one of us here belong to more than one community in the following ways. Let's say, Gender. Gender may create an identity towards a, belonging to a community. Let's say at least, let's say your region where you're from. Let's say your political position. And um, which country are you rooting for in the World Cup right now? All these things mark our belonging to a community. And the question is within that community, how do we deliberate? How do we change each other's hearts and minds in terms of convincing each other or where do we want to move next? But of course, it is frustrating sometimes that even within these so-called communities, within the boundaries of what we call community, we are powerless or hopeless. But at the same time, many of these cases that I have been mentioned are cases of bottom-up processes that created within the community a sense of belonging to something that pushed them to agree into a next step of change of behavior. So for example, in the foot binding case in China, 
these were small associations. They call them societies for natural fit. Think about that. Societies for natural fit. But what these were, were just small groups of Chinese families that said, this is horrendous that we are doing to these to our girls. It's just horrible. And they began to create certain mechanisms in which they all agreed within the community. But the trick, do you know what the trick was? The trick was that within the community, this, within the society, they made a pact in which they said, okay, if I have a daughter, I commit to not binding her feet. And if I have a son, I commit to marry my son with a girl that has non-bound feet. And it began creating like that. And then from society to society to society, something began to change and it changed the tradition of a thousand years. It, it could be a, an extreme example, but it's a very telling example. And if you read about the women's war in Nigeria, it's similar in other ways. It was a group of women who began to shame men who were complicit with the British rule, absurd rules that the British were imposing on the Nigerian communities. And it was women because of their identity and because women were excluded from power. Although in Nigerian tradition, women were very much involved in political power at the local level, that they began to organize as women with certain practices to shame public officers and to shame even their own spouses that were acceptant of what the British were doing. So what I'm trying to say is again, there is something about an identity that makes us belong to a group. And within that group, we think that there is something that could be better for us as a group. And we coordinate until we achieve that change, that small change within that. And eventually that translates to another group next to us and another group next to us. Of course, when we think about the major challenges, I am puzzled right now. Eight billion people on earth, and we all need to figure out the problem of climate change. And thinking of this framework might sound naive, that there's going to be a revolution from below for eight billion people. But at the same time, it can push changes scaling up in level all the way to regions or to cities or to countries. Notice what is happening in the US. Trump got out of the Paris Agreement. And that was a disaster as a country. But in the meantime, cities like Los Angeles, states like California, cities like New York, began to pass laws that were, regardless of what Trump was doing at the federal level, they were all doing, already doing things. And this started from communities getting together and thinking, we need to pass a law to reduce the use of gas cars, uh, fossil fuel-based cars. We need to pass a law that encourages uh, electric vehicles. We need to pass laws that are going to promote solar energy. And these things to began, began to happen from small neighborhoods to cities. So this is the kind of transformation that I'm talking about. But it could be the identity associated with many things. As I said, geographic proximity is another way of creating identity. We all share this particular park that we want to preserve or we share this ethnicity, or we share this language, or we share this identity towards um, veganism, and so on and so on. And it, through these identities, we began to, to, to create the changes within the groups. Maybe I can pick up from there. So I was always thinking about this flying less community of academicians, you know, they commit themselves like Professor Kevin Anderson, also including Greta Thunberg and so on. So they have this kind of naive, individual action that could, I was thinking, I committed myself to flying less before the pandemic. And then I was thinking, maybe I'm naive, but I'm gonna do it anyways, you know? And then I felt part of this community somehow, uh, but then many colleagues and like friends were like saying, ah, you know, it's naive, you're not gonna change the world. But then yeah. now thinking through, through this C frame, I think, I mean, like this can change norms, that this can pressurize the systems, can contribute to changing the system perhaps. So you're gonna see what the outcome will be of this flight less community but maybe we're gonna later on study it as a as a kind of a, an experiment i don't know yeah. um no, I, I i the, the, the example of flying is, is fascinating i mean look at think about it think about many of the things that i said how it is involved here first 
uh, carbon offsets. Have you seen that? I mean, they're offering you carbon offsets all over the place for, for taking a flight, right? But yeah. it is the companies, the airlines, promoting back to the consumers the responsibility. Secondly, we know carbon offsets have a lot of questions these days to be answered. I mean, there's big debates on how much carbon offsets are going to change things. Third, it looks like the airline industry is not changing in the sense of the number of miles being flown as, as we are recovering from the pandemic. What are the changes that are going to require? Maybe beginning to push for, for loss. I mean, you probably have seen all these maps recently in Europe of how many places are within three hours by train, right? That could easily be forbidden for flights. I know it's a tough decision to make, but maybe we need regulations that say if you are within this particular time frame, you should be taking public transportation like trains that we know that per capita, per mile transported, the emissions are going to be much higher. But with this idea of the carbon offsets that you go click when you make your airline reservation and you feel good about yourself, and you don't know if that carbon offset is going to save a hectare of the Amazon or not, because we don't know. Literally, we don't know if it is saving that. But you feel about yourself good, then it reduces the possibility of having the conversation as a collective. So maybe Pinar's action can be combined with talking to other people in the departments and say, hey, we have this particular tradition of having this seminar or this event. And if we change that in a way that we can reduce the carbon footprint, but collectively we begin to do things, maybe other universities begin to think about this and more communities begin to think about this. But for sure, there are certain things that can begin to happen in, in, in many accounts. But that's a great example of the flying because that's that's a perfect, uh, um, yeah, a perfect example of what is happening in terms of the individual actions and then the aggregate. Okay, I think Pelin is raising your hand. Pelin Atakan, please. Hi, hi. Thank you for this very uh, mind-opening and very interesting talk. And I'm also studying uh, behavioral economics and agricultural economics. Now I'm currently uh, uh, kind of designing my PhD research. And I was always wondering uh, why uh, iframe wouldn't work. And uh, your, your talk uh, made me wonder about uh, what, what's your opinion on uh, the conditions that C frame might not work and in influencing uh, the, the systemic change? Yeah, that's that's a good question because definitely I am I am looking at all the positive potential positive effects. No, I, I think that there are a couple of ways. And, and now that you asked, Pelin, thank you for the question. I, I I think there are certain things that we need to think about. Let me give you one that I always fear, which is the local elite appropriating C frame type of dynamics and creating even more unequal or unfair outcomes, right? So you empower communities, right? Uh, but within the communities, the local elites now appropriate even more of the proceeds or the returns from the collective action process and create harsher inequalities within the communities. This is something that we should never forget. I see this even in the field when I have been to the field and run experiments, I have to be very careful in who shows up for the experiments and what kind of dynamics happen within the experiments that tell me clues about the local elites. And I even wrote a paper many years ago about this particular session and in which the owner of the land of the entire village that was participating in the experiment was sitting there. And the dynamics of the experiment was fascinating. But at the same time, I, I had to be very careful of the implementation of the experiment for the, of the, on the first place, and also an understanding the dynamics of what happened within that particular session of the experiment, and in contrast with other data points from the rest of the, of the sessions that I run. So again, this is probably one of those places in which we have to be careful, I would say. Uh, the problem of local elites uh, creating dynamics that can be problematic. Um, there is a paper that Michael Kremer, who recently won the Nobel Prize, he wrote a paper many years ago 
Um, and the original paper title was The Rockefeller Effect. And then he changed the, the title um, probably for, for uh, political, I don't know the reasons, I don't know. He changed the, the title. And this was a, an intervention that they did in Kenya in which they were going to empower women with uh, money to set up small businesses. And what they end up finding is that the money was appropriated mostly by the spouses and the daughters of the local elites. And it made things worse. This is the kind of thing that I worry about because this was supposedly to be empowering local groups and local women through the gender agenda, which is all valid and important. And at the end, it was problematic. And, and it's an interesting paper. This was many, many years ago, way back. Uh, and I don't know what the title of the paper ended up being because I, I looked it up again as the Rockefeller effect and I didn't find it. But anyway, those are two examples that I would give of, of when the C-frame, we have to be careful with the C-frame. Thank you very much. And good luck with your research design. And I look forward to hear through Pinar about the results later. Thank you very much. You're so kind. Any other questions, comments, feedback, or cases that you want to yeah, mention, perhaps? And, 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 and I'm serious about this. If you know because you have read a book about history or something, in which we, you have heard of something of this kind of dynamics, please send me an email because I'm beginning to collect case studies that I want to, to research more and see what are the common patterns of these kind of things. W would you share your email then in the chat or maybe uh, yes, Mara yes. will share us let, later? Let me give you here my email right now. Oops, uh, that's a good idea. Um, so here is the email right now. This one should do. Yeah, thank you very much. That's no, great. thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the questions. Those are really interesting. Uh, to what extent can you think, do you think that this S frame, like the policymakers, those in power, how do you, how would we reach them or how, how realistic is to expect from them to give realistic or kind of honest, I don't know, um, answers to our questions yeah. or experiments? I, yeah, I mean, that, that's a big question. I, I, I am very skeptical that we can get those people into the lab, okay? And... Um, Still, maybe we can try. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we need to find other ways of studying the dynamics of the elites and the dynamics of the powerful to understand the, 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 the preferences of the powerful. When, when, what I'm trying to say is the following. Um, once you are in power, determining this, the S frame for the better or for worse, it's because you have at stake a lot to either change that or to maintain that, right? In fact, you probably pursue power because you want to either control or change the spray structure. So the question is, did you get there because you had particular preferences? So one, one possibility is that you have certain particular preferences that made you get there, right? So let's say in the corporate private sector world, um, if the pursuit of capitalism, uh, or, or not the pursuit of capitalism, but one of the, right, the reasons for capitalism to be so successful is that you get firms that pursue profit by hiring people, managing capital, and getting uh, the company to be profitable in the market by competing. Does that mean that you need more individualistic people in power Maybe, maybe we need those people in power to be more uh, competitive. And when I say competitive, is with more competitive preferences in terms of um, uh, fighting to get ahead and to, to compete in the market and to innovate. And maybe those people have certain preferences for that, okay? And um, how do we measure that? It is a little bit hard. I don't think we should just make assumptions. We should try to measure that. Are they any different? than other people who didn't make it to the top. Did they make it to the top because of that? That's a possibility. But it doesn't mean that those people in power are not prosocial. I mean, I am pretty sure that many people in power do care about the others, care about fairness, care about the environment. And sometimes they are legitimately in, in positions. When, when I mention about ESG strategies in corporations, 
maybe in some cases they are genuinely uh, concerned about the environment, right? Uh, and we need to measure that too. Uh, sometimes they just do it as a greenwashing kind of a strategy. Sometimes they do it as a way of to maintain the public image of the corporation. Who knows? It's very hard. Look at what happened with Patagonia and the owner of Patagonia. The owner of Patagonia is a fascinating case. And I wish I could have that guy in the lab in an experiment, but I don't know if I'm going to learn much. Maybe I would learn more through a long interview using behavioral ideas, behavioral concepts, and design an interview to get at the core of why he's doing what he's doing. But at the same time, I would love to interview Elon Musk with this mess with Twitter. It's just a mess. But at the same time, I would love to see the dynamics within, within Twitter, in the communities within Twitter. I mean, look at the massive resignation that recently happened to, to a couple of days ago. But at the same time, the re-recruitment back of a whole bunch of people. And I am pretty sure that many of these happen because of group dynamics. Like, okay, we are all in this division of Twitter. We are all agreeing that we're going to do this. And let's do it. Somebody was telling me recently, you probably know about Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks was born without unions, right? And one of the, of the challenges of the Star, Starbucks CEO is to avoid the creation of unions by trying to be fair to all workers, et cetera. And yet there's a unionization movement within Starbucks. And somebody was telling me recently that most of the cases where they have passed the vote to, to create a union within a Starbucks store, it passed by unanimous vote. So it's all or nothing. Why? Because of the group dynamics, social pressure, ostracism, peer pressure, or shaming and guilt. All these things that we know of are operating so that if the, if the vote passes, it's because it was unanimous. It wasn't like a simple majority. So these are the kind of things that we need to think about how to, to understand these different uh, examples and then think about the, the aggregate, how it ends up changing. But then at the powerful, I don't know if it's going to be through experiments. Maybe it's other type of tools. Yeah, thank you. The example of Patagonia also struck, struck me a lot. So yeah, thanks for touching on that too. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions, comments, anyone who wants to contribute? Okay. Ah, Ali Kerem Hocam. Yes. I think you're muted. Yes. So, so uh, the, yeah. So, what you what you are saying is very interesting. But uh, I just want to ask uh, how, to what extent can the experimental or behavioral research can help us understand the possibilities of the S change the the system change you think because there can be, I mean, there can be lots of methodologies, yeah. academic, quasi academic activists to understand the possibilities of X, S change system change. But you are particularly focusing on experimental behavioral research. So, how how would you frame it? The 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 contribution of experimental behavioral research, yeah, to I, help I mean, us and yeah yeah. yeah. No, no, that, 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 that's, a, that's an important question. So, so recently in, in, in another conference, we were having a, a discussion similar to this. And, and some people raised the point that said, this looks more like sociology from the 70s, right? And, and I think it's a, fair, it's a fair question. It's a fair point. But, but it is not only that. When, when I say sociology from the 70s, is that sociologists who, by the way, have contributed way more and earlier to economics through the study of social networks is one of those avenues of work in understanding the dynamics of groups through understanding how social networks operate. And that's a good example. So what we know now from experimental and behavioral economics is that now we have a better understanding of how the preferences and the actions, the choices that humans make are motivated by different material and non-material incentives. I, I, I would classify them as, as three types of incentives, financial, moral, and social, okay? Financial meaning actual monetary incentives that affect our decisions. It is true, I mean, 
we do care and we do have trade-offs between paying for something that is more organic but more expensive, but up to a point. I mean, Patagonia clothing is supposed to be, to, to talk about that example, Patagonia clothing is supposed to be more sustainable and it lasts more and that's great, but it's more expensive. And at some point, some people say, yeah, that's a nice jacket, but it's really expensive. I cannot go all the way to it. And other people say, yeah, I can pay 10, 20, 30, for more, uh, 40 more euros uh, for that. So financial incentives. Then moral incentives. Now we understand much better because of behavioral experimental economics about moral incentives. Like for example, guilt. We can now measure better this concept of guilt. Do we feel bad to ourselves when we look at, at, at us at the mirror and feel bad about breaking the law, doing the wrong thing, harming others, harming the environment? We now have better tools thanks to behavioral and experimental economics to understand if we really care morally speaking, even at a personal material cost, if we do really care about something that in this case is important for the environment or for society. And then the social incentives is the third part. And the social, the social incentives have to do with shaming public ostracism or social ostracism, peer pressure, following the, the norms of others, herding behavior, and experimental and behavioral economics has given us lots of tools to understand this type of behaviors of why do we follow social norms? Why, when they tell us that most people do this thing, then we follow that. So for example, the, the banking example that I mentioned in this nudges that we did this study with the, with the credit loans, what we found is that the most effective mechanism was telling people on their phone through a text message that Eight out of 10, which was true, eight out of 10 clients were paying on time their credit loan. It was the most impactful, more than the financial incentives and more than the, even the personal incentives about uh, the commitment to the bank and et cetera. So these are the things that behavioral and experimental economists have, have led us to understand the mechanisms, the micro mechanisms of the financial, the moral and the social incentives. Uh, when we think about the environment, it's going to be the same. When we think about getting people to eat less meat, I can imagine that in Turkey, it is probably a, an interesting challenge because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a culture that eats lots of meat from different animals. And at the same time, the carbon footprint of that is an important thing to consider. And then we think about how we transition from a more plant-based culture. There are probably financial, social, and moral incentives. And behavioral and experimental economics have lots to, te to teach us on how to do that. But once we understand that, then we need to move up to the next level and it's within communities, how do we get this transition? So that it is not this little behavior, but a behavior that is large enough that get us all to do the changes that we want so that in the aggregate, we notice something forward, something that, that we can uh, uh, evaluate and say, now it is worth pursuing this, this policy, this policy change. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, if maybe one more brief question or uh, else we can, I think, finish slowly. Anyone else? Okay, I think now that you have Juan Camilo's email, <laughs> you can also send your questions later on, yes, but please. he's a busy person uh, and thank you so much for reserving the time for us in this morning and uh, I know that you have been giving a lot of more talks at other instances, so thank you, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, a big pleasure for all of us to hosting you here and we are hoping to host you here face to face, hopefully in the near future. Uh, if things go well at our university, um, let's hope for that for a face to face meeting next time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Pinar. And, and I look forward to, to a visit because I've never been to Turkey and it's one of those places that I have in my in my list that I definitely want to visit someday. So we'll, we'll try to make that happen. And yes. thank you for the invitation and thank you for the time being here and listening to these ideas and look forward to hear from all of you at some point in the future. OK, thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, you for our audience too. Thank you. Uh, okay. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.